it's wonderful to see so many of you here. How many of you were able to attend the conservative messaging session yesterday? Yeah, yeah? How many people have, have used those resources on community, on, on conservative messaging? Yes? Great. Great. It's terrific. So you'll be well along the, uh, the chain here. So um, I suspect many of you are here because you know that to solve climate change, you first have to bridge the partisan divide. Does that sound, is that why you're here? Yes, yes. Okay, good, good. This is really um, terrific. Um, um, so I have the odd fortune to divide my time between a blue state where I live, Massachusetts, and a red state where I have a business and family. And I am keenly aware of this partisan divide problem and the fact that we live in our bubbles and we don't think there's anything different than our bubbles. And so I am um, very passionate about this issue and I'm so happy that our families were able to come and help us deal with this issue and um, we will have hopefully some time for questions if we can get through this quickly. Um, and most importantly for CCL to be effective really increase the number of conservative members, especially in red states, especially in red states, because um, we right now are, are, are a bipartisan organization that's not very well balanced, so we need all of your help. Um, so we have um, esteemed panelists with us who are um, starting with um, RJ Lyman on uh, the end there, uh, senior advisor at ML Strategies, founder of Unite Center, and uh, he served under two Republican governors in Massachusetts, in the Mass CPA. Uh, next to him is Claudine Schneider, Honorable Claudine Schneider, who you may have heard at the wonderful keynote this morning, 10-year Republican member of Congress from Rhode Island. Um, hey, Peter Bren is Peter Bren is CCL's Conservative Caucus Director, and. Um, will be doing a short presentation um, on my, uh, right? Um, Al Alex Smith is the national chair of the College Republican National Committee, which is having its conference in two days, so we are very lucky to have her here. Um, and Sean, um, and Sean Tima is the Midwest Regional Director for Young Americans for Liberty. So, Peter will give a short introduction to the CCL caucus and tell us more about the great tools and resources, some of which you've already availed yourselves of, and give just a few key takeaways on conservative messaging, but just the main points. So um, panelists will then give a little introduction to themselves and lead into a short presentation, after which we will do some moderated questions, and if you have time, some questions from the microphone. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Zori. Uh, so I'm going to make this as quick as possible because really we want to hear from our guests who are with us today. Um, and, but I always like to start with the question of, you know, why conservatives, right? And I think Zori already spoke to this, but perhaps one of the best quotes to answer this question is um, uh, one of my favorites from Congressman Bob Inglis, who says, if you are a progressive, behold in conservatives your indispensable partners for action. It will not happen without them. Right, so we need to get support on all sides of the political spectrum. Um, I think we went a little out of order. There's our panel. We'll, we can get back to that slide in a minute. What I wanted to do, though, is I just spend a few minutes. If you are not familiar with the CCL Conservative Caucus, to introduce the caucus, what we do, who we are, and also uh, share some of the tools. And if some of you identify as conservative or yourselves, we'd love to welcome you into the caucus. So the caucus is a group of CCL volunteers who self-identify as Republican, Libertarian, and or fiscally conservative independents. Uh, and we are really focused on growing our base of conservative volunteers within the organization, helping to improve our messaging to make sure that we don't you know, trip over ourselves trying to say the right thing to the, to the right audience, uh, and making sure that our, our chapters and our messaging is, resonates with conservative audiences. And as I said, if you are interested, please, please uh, let us know. We'd love to have more volunteers, uh, more members in the caucus. So some caucus highlights, we work with uh, national organizations. Um, these are some of the ones we've met with over time. We were at CPAC this year. That was really exciting for the first time. 
Um, <clears throat> we are working out in the field uh, with the California GOP. We just did a presentation with the uh, Libertarian uh, Party of Ohio. We're giving presentations in Texas to young Republican clubs and so on. And um, yeah, and I kept that real short and sweet because I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it. We got to open it for the panelists. A couple of resources you'll find on CCL Community. Uh, there's some printable resources. So as you go to do tabling events, uh, especially if it's at a conservative venue, we have uh, full and quarter page flyers. We have our conservative caucus webpage, which is citizensclimatelobby.org slash conservatives. It's rather basic right now, so you know, don't, uh, don't keep, your, keep your expectations modest. But uh, we are improving the site, uh, so we want to make it more, uh, more of a welcome place. But it is a way for conservative folks to find us and come into the organization. Also, if you're a member of the caucus, we have a conservative uh, a slide deck that's kind of geared toward that audience a little bit more, has some improved messaging versus our standard one. Uh, but really what I wanted to spend the bulk of the rest of my time uh, up here talking about was focusing on a couple of the key aspects. If you were at the conservative messaging thing yesterday, you heard a few of these, but I just want to repeat them because I think they're some of the key ones that are relevant for our message about addressing the, uh, you know, the, the climate risk in a, in a, in a conservative market-based way. And so some of the, the key takeaways that we talked about yesterday at the panel uh, or at the training uh, workshop was, you know, first of all, we need to be trusted messengers. One of the key things we focused on is before you try to convince anybody of anything, they need, they need to trust you, right? Messenger is more important than message sometimes. And so we always, and you hear this again and again in CCL, we always talk about listen for values. We don't want to jump to conclusions. We don't want to assume we know who we're talking to. We really have to listen to folks, understand their concerns. Uh, a lot of conservative folks have concerns about the economy, what responding to climate change would mean for their quality of life and, and cost of energy and things like that. And we have to be sensitive to that. So that's, that's the first point. Um, another thing we touched on is the fact that many conservatives are ready to act, right? I mean, look at the representation on the stage here. Uh, there are a lot of indications, whether it be polling, frankly, anecdotal from folks in the caucus, that if you look on the conservative side, there are a lot of folks who really do want a solution to this problem. They recognize it's a risk. They recognize it's a challenge. They just want to see a solution that aligns with their value set. So if we go into the assumption that, oh, Republicans don't care about climate change, you've already lost your audience because that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So try to get rid of those, those preconceived notions. Uh, the third, and this is a really key one, and again, one I uh, credit Bob Inglis for, for pointing out frequently, solution aversion, in, in my view, is one of the key things that's at the heart of climate skepticism. When you hear the word climate change, what do you think? Big problem. Oh my gosh, we gotta act, right? That's why you're all here. You're concerned about it. If you see it as a concern to the future livelihood of Americans, to the, to the country, to the planet, uh, and to people, a lot of folks who are skeptical on this issue, at the heart of what they hear when you say climate change is, we're gonna send the government in to put more taxes on you. We're going, we want you to stop driving your car. We want you to turn the air conditioning off, you know? <laughs> we gotta stop enjoying the qualities of life that we have today. So. The issue is tackling that solution aversion up front and saying, no, we're not against those things. We want to do, we just want to do energy better. We want to do it cleaner. We want to do it more affordably, more efficiently. So trying to get ahead of that, that those preconceived notions is really important in addressing those concerns right up front. Uncertainty, right? Uh, we often hear the argument of uncertainty. Don't let uncertainty paralyze us in turn, in, into not acting. We often hear, well, the science isn't in yet, so we shouldn't act. That's a perfect opportunity to say, well, you know, look, the military does a lot of things without perfect information. Um, I used to work in oil and gas. The oil and gas industry drills a lot of wells. They don't have perfect information. You identify the risk and you manage that risk. So we can act in the face of uncertainty. We just need to do it smartly and with a policy like ours that allows us to make adjustments in the future as we learn more information. And finally, reference trusted validators. If you want to reference, uh, in fact, you'll probably get some good uh, ammunition for that here today. Uh, the College Republican National Committee's done some good work on understanding where college Republicans are on climate. Reference folks like, we all talk about Jim Baker and George Shultz and Bob Inglis and ExxonMobil and the US Department of Defense. Reference those validators and maybe you know keep Al Gore and the others in your back pocket. You don't want to throw those out in a conservative audience. So, with that, I'm going to hand it over. This is just our last uh, teaser slide. If you want to get involved in the caucus, please do. And otherwise, I'll hand it back to Zori to do our introductions or pass the mic around, I guess. Do we have her mic? Uh, yeah. 
So good afternoon, everyone. Really glad to be here. Thank you again to Zori and to Peter for putting this together. What's up? And up? Okay. How's this? Better? Excellent. So I'm with Young Americans for Liberty. Uh, we're the largest and fastest growing pro-liberty group on college campuses in the country. We've got over about 900 chapters in all 50 states, and we stand on the pillars of the free market, ending mass spying of citizens, sober criminal justice reform, and sober foreign policy. Now, you'll notice that climate isn't intrinsically in our five pillars, but I see, and many young, liberty-minded, and conservative folks like me see climate change and the solution to a changing climate through the free market. We're in a generation where Uber has sprung out and innovated out of the free market, where there's an iPhone in everyone's pocket, there's a computer in everybody's home. You know, this didn't come from Bernie Sanders being reelected six times or Rand Paul in his second term. This came from ingenuity, this came from innovation, it came from the free market. And what many young liberty-minded folks are seeing out there is a government that we can't trust to solve problems, whether it's getting your DMV forms in in a timely manner or effectively changing the climate. For example, you know, across Obama's term, we saw $500 million, over $500 million, being thrown out on Solyndra, and plenty of people lost their jobs off of that. We saw over 3 million gallons of wastewater dumped in a Colorado River and the federal government's refusing to hold itself accountable. We saw for a year and a half state bureaucrats sitting idle and letting wastewater seep into Flint, Michigan, affecting its people, and there's no accountability there. You know, with the rise of uh, many votes going to Bernie, many votes going to Trump, we see young people not wanting to trust the government, and why should we do this for climate solutions? So we're skeptical, but we're optimistic if we turn to some alternative solutions. Think of three entrepreneurs that come to mind, Tim Whitley, founder of COTAP, a nonprofit where you can donate the cost of your carbon footprint directly to a fund that will plant trees down in third world countries. Think of Emily Wilkinson, founder of Bot Vocal. She saw plastic bottles and plastic accumulation as an issue, so she launched her own business, Bot Filter, where we can now buy portable water filters as a free market solution to this problem. Jagar Shah, founder of a solar energy company, whose name falls out of my head at this time, but rather than you know, lobbying to pass a law or putting a tax on his competitors, he revamped his business model. So that way, you know, he bought the solar energy panels, invested the capital there. The consumers just paid for the electricity cost, and that provided solar to many, many people out there. So there are ways that we can change this. We can help prevent this climate change from getting worse. It just doesn't have to come from government, and that's the foundation that we see ourselves as at Young Americans for Liberty and many liberty student activists out there. I'm looking forward to the dialogue and hearing other solutions from the audience and from my fellow panelists. But at the end of the day, I don't trust the same people who run the DMV to save the planet. I trust people in this room. My name is Alexandra Smith. I have the privilege of serving as the national chair for the College Republican National Committee. Um, I have been in this role since 2013, but I have been a college Republican for the last 10 years. Uh, so this is actually my last week on the job, so truly a sort of a, a life change for me here. Um, but for the last 10 years, I've been committed to fighting for our party on college campuses, a place where we see conservative and Republican values woefully underrepresented and even under attack in some circumstances. Um, so I started out at the very bottom of college Republicans. I was just a kid at the table registering voters and uh, helping our club out. Um, I gradually uh, rose through the ranks in, in college Republicans. Um, but it wasn't until the 2012 election that I really decided um, to run for national leadership myself and to become involved in a full-time way. Uh, at that time, I was a second-year law student. Um, I had gone up to Boston to be with our college Republicans on election night, and what did we find out on election night? Not only were we not going to win the election, but we, were, we also weren't going to win the election because of young voters, um, a group of voters that our party had just not reached out to. Um, so in the same way, um, that this group here is concerned about places where your voices and your ideas and your um, important thoughts aren't being heard to a conservative audience, 
I've been facing the opposite problem. I've been facing a, you know, a problem where conservative and Republican values aren't getting out to college students and getting out in a systematic uh, way from our party. Um, and so under my leadership at the national level, we've done independent expenditures, we've done a revamped field program on college campuses. Uh, we're the oldest and largest youth vote organization in the country. This year marks our 125th birthday. Um, so we have, we've been around for a long time. Um, and obviously as the party changes, as, as um, you know, as, as elections change and as our country changes, um, the CRNC needs to sort of be with the time. So that's why we've invested so much of our, of our time and our money into um, research that you referenced um, on young voters to figure out where our party can most effectively message um, to this critical group of voters who will decide elections for years to come. Um, and as Peter mentioned, the, one of the most important issues to this group of young voters, group of young independent swing voters, is climate change. Um, and so not only do, you know, does this group have to meet Republicans where they are sort of in the middle, but we as Republicans have to meet you all in the middle, particularly when it comes to reaching young voters. So I would say that we have a, a shared goal here, and I look forward to the discussion. Congressman, we've decided we're going to save the best for last. Yeah. I'm going to come speak up here. No room too large in which I need a microphone. So let me tell you a little bit about what kind of, let me tell you what kind of Republican I am. I'm a Republican from Massachusetts. Somebody once hearing my ideology described in some length said, I don't understand. How can you be a Republican feeling as you do? And I said, well, I know family history and early career and these particular memories. Oh, well, I understand what's Everybody you admire is dead. <laughs> so my former boss, Bill Weld, is still alive. My great uh, friend, a group on great fans, Claudia Schneider, is still alive. But I am going to start by quoting uh, one of my favorite Republican thinkers on many issues, including on the environment. That was popular, not popular in certain quarters of the Republican Party for a long time. But he had two things to say, which I think is really apt. One was that there is no problem and not be solved. There was, there was once a judge in Massachusetts who spoke about the need for an office of state janitor. I've often thought that most legislatures also need an office of governmental editor because we add things on without always remembering how they conflict with the other things we have. So the way I tend to talk about my own philosophy, and again, that forms how I think about uh, talking about these issues, uh, with uh, both conservatives and liberals, is I don't say that I'm a liberal or that I'm a conservative. I say that I am a prudent progressive. I believe in a progressive society that enables people to fulfill uh, its, the society's core purpose. Uh, as Abraham Lincoln said, we were a nation conceived in liberty. I don't know whether it's a libertarian, a liberal, or a conservative principle. I don't need to answer that question to know that there's a common humanity to all of us. And at the same time, prudence. I don't need to overlearn the lessons of the great society and think we can solve all problems by regulating our way through them. But at the same time, I don't need to overlearn the lessons of the Reagan Revolution and believe the government is the problem or that taxes are always an afterthought. Taxes, Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, are the price we pay for a civilized society. So when I think about this as a conservative, what I think about is what we're trying to conserve. We're trying to conserve, in my view, both a free society and also an extraordinary heritage of this planet. So uh, let me give you an example before I conclude of how it is I might talk with a conservative about climate change. Uh, there are lots of them. This is one example that seems to have worked rather well for real reasons. So um, I will observe a friend uh, concerned with about climate change, very focused, liberal, explaining you need to understand the science, you need to understand the health impacts, you need to believe, you need to agree. And the conservative, just like any other human being, no matter if it's a liberal or conservative, they want to be browbeaten to believe 
that act differently than they are naturally inclined to will naturally want to resist. We all do. Uh, instead, I change the way of thinking about it. And I usually try to come up with what in my case usually tends to be some warped metaphor or analogy. So when talking about economics, I don't go in uh, ponderously about all sorts of things I really don't understand. I'm afraid to be a lawyer. Um, but instead, what I do is I try to explain uh, why it is prudent to address issues related to climate change. And the example I give often is about uh, uh, your uh, electricity bill. That you buy electrons every month from a utility company. The way you do that is a little bit like renting a house rather than buying it. Renting it from OPEC uh, or the large corporations which frack and extract natural gas. Now, I may have my personal views on various fuels, but when you have a fuel-based power generation system, you are renting those electrons. You have to buy them anew every single month. Opposed to a non-fuel-based generation system, uh, I would actually be going to nuclear if that even though it's life that extends to people that are capital based. So you're naturally buying your house. So if you want to rent your house from people who are either a large corporation or a foreign uh, nation, you can do that. Most of us would prefer to own our houses. It's imprudent not to look at power generation as a way of behaving in a way that is protective, nationalistic, and sensible. Uh, so I can talk about plenty of other ways to talk about other details of sort of going through the discussion, but I wanted to at least frame for you a little bit about how to think uh, a little differently than we've tended to. As we've tended to do, we've tended to do what I uh, often think uh, happens a, a lot to lawyers, you know. Lawyers, uh, you go to court as a lawyer, and you have the facts with you. Uh, uh, if you don't have the facts with you, you argue the law. If you don't have the law with you, you argue the facts. And if you don't have either of them with you, you wave your arms and make noise like a lawyer. That, sadly, has, has happened to both the left and the right in this country. And what I'm suggesting is that there are ways in which we can change the way we think about, not just talk about, but think about key issues so we can start to talk about them more often. Thank you. Thank you. So it seems like a good question to ask is, given that the Republican Party is so diverse and the conservative is so diverse that there's time more than in recent memory, what areas of the conservative movement are areas that you might want to think about engaging if you're working on our you know, some climate solutions? Are there thoughts that you'd like to see from you? And, uh, I mean, there's a wide range out there, and I'm just wondering. Give you some guidance. <laughs> Did you see that song? So I'm a little bit biased, but of course I think that younger people are an obvious target for this group and for, for others to target in terms of um, influencing their opinions. Um, you know, I think something that's true of the entire millennial generation is that this is a decidedly less partisan generation um, than previous generations have been. Um, this is a generation that's less tied to sort of dogma and to, and to um, you know, sort of partisan corners. Um, you know, that our parents or our grandparents have been. So in short, it's not that, that our principles can't, um, you know, as, as conservatives and as, uh, you know, people on the center right, it's not that our, our principles uh, can't resonate with this group. In fact, uh, we resonate with them in their everyday behaviors. Every, every time that they open their smartphone, every time um, that they do something, they engage with the free market, whether they know it or not, whether they express that in the terms of freedom or not. Um, so I think in the long term, um, you know, I think that our principles are actually, the principles that they're using in their everyday life are on our side. Um, but, you know, I think it's not so much an adherence to party, it's more an adherence to, uh, I think, a, seeking a common understanding um, and doing what's practical for their lives. Uh, and some of the research that we did, you can find this at millennial.gop. Uh, we did a, a whole research report on younger voters, um, young independent voters. Uh, and what we found was that young people very much do want solutions on climate change, uh, and that this would this would be an ideal group to target um, for this group and for our and, and for our purposes. 
um, just because their opinions are a little bit more malleable than previous generations have been. This is a generation that's much more open. Um, so I think it's about the right approach, it's about the message, it's about the messenger, um, it's about engaging them directly where they are. Yeah, definitely want to echo a lot of points that Alex made about you know, engaging young folks and weaving them in because because we do care. Uh, this isn't uh, something that's as dominant of skepticism on the issue of climate change within millennials, within upcoming Generation Z. Uh, you know, to add additional points, um, kind of thrown back to what Zuri and I were talking right before this uh, you know, this panel kicked off, is that when we look at what the messaging is on the Republican side, kind of the fervor with the members of Congress or off of the last campaign, you know, jobs are a key issue. So if you can take that message of you know climate solutions, but intrinsically tying it to job creation, if you take that in, I mean, I think that no politician can sit on an issue if it's you know, if you make it too hot. So if there's a way that we can bring in the notion of hey, clean energy, renewable energy will open up this job market, tying in perhaps with the fervor with anti-corruption that's going on now, building off this campaign and exposing some of the subsidies that are keeping uh, you know, fossil fuels, coal afloat, and taking it from that angle and providing a truly free, a truly fair market where the best product will win, uh, then that's an angle that we could take that might you know, convey strength and could lead to some real action. Great. Perfect. So following the vein of keeping the conversation going, what are some key arguments, conservative, libertarian, Republican, whatever, arguments um, to address, how to address climate change? What are, what are the, the words, the messages, the, the phrases that resonate and that we should that keep chanting? I'm curious, how many of you have heard the phrase, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Okay, millennials, write this one down. It's an important one because I met a millennial the other day who was doing a survey and I asked her and she never heard of it. So I think it was Ben Franklin, but we got to pass it along. So here's the scoop. Conservatives are fiscally responsible, right? Climate is a problem, right? How do we deal with it in a financially responsible way? Well, you can dig up my Global Warming Prevention Act, which was the first and only revenue neutral bill that addressed the challenge. But the second thing you need to know is that if we don't act right away, the pr problem, as we are seeing, is exacerbating. So when the scientists talked to me in the 1980s, they said, we believe that there is going to be weather extremes. We believe that the incidences of hurricanes and tornadoes are going to be more frequent. We believe that we are going to see more forest fires, more flooding, more drought, the cost of food escalating, and guess what? All of those things are coming to pass. So, what do we do about it? Well, we have CCL's agenda there are many things that we as individuals can do, but the fact of the matter is FEMA is out of money, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, every single year, and there is always reluctance to fund it. So who's going to pick up the tab when hundreds of thousands of people are dealing with storm surges, which by the way, I was recently speaking to the guys at NOAA, the scientists at NOAA, and they said, we need to get word to the Congress because 14 of our major airports are in storm surge areas. So if we just rebuild them and make them look a little nicer, we're not gonna solve the problem. So the bottom line is prevention is worth, a, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure because not only is the federal government through FEMA and other federal agencies now required to come in and rebuild bridges and help with the storm surges and help do repair much of the damage that has happened throughout the United States, but it's all this, also the state governments who don't have the budget to do that and the charitable organizations are also on the ropes dealing with these natural disasters. So the bottom line is 
we need to think further than our nose and anticipate that if we pay more attention to prevention and using our money wisely, then we'd be much better off. So uh, I'm going to, as a Republican male, I'm going to resist the temptation to say to my friend Cody, if I ever run for Congress and I want to be a feeling caring person rather than an ego driven person, should I change from being a Republican or change from being a male? <laughs> <laughs> One will, one, one will disappoint my wife, the other will disappoint my parents. Uh, let, indulge, indulge, me, indulge me for a moment in not answering Zori's question head on, but giving you yet another context. But in this instance, instead of talking about the overall political dynamic, let me talk about history for a moment. It's very common when we talk about climate change, to talk about the unprecedented challenge. I don't think that's true. It's also very common these days to talk about the current political dysfunction in our country, and in particular, the scariness of the commander in chief, and say that's unprecedented. And that's also not true. And in fact, people talk about, especially liberals, how scary it is that the Republican Party has cohered and grown so much, seemingly monolithically. And again, that's not unprecedented. Let me give you a couple of examples, and in particular, tell you what happens thereafter, or has happened. So the Republican Party were the defenders of, as they were known at the time, the malefactors of great wealth in the Gilded Age, the only time in our country's history when income and wealth distribution were as inequitable as they are now. And the Republican Party soon came to be led by the man who busted the trusts, Teddy Roosevelt, and in the progressive era, not an accidental term for those of us who think about that heritage. In fact, went exactly the other way on the very issue of the accumulation of wealth and corporate organizations that continue to hold it, on the very issue that was at that time the core underpinning of the society and the core Republican Party ideology. Similarly, in the mid-20th century, Henry Cabot Lodge and Tom Dewey, uh, certain that their own political ambitions wouldn't take them beyond the senatorship and governorship went and recruited a person who at that point most people thought was going to be a Democrat, former ally commander of <laughs> Europe, as committed an internationalist as possible as Dwight Eisenhower, who became president. What was the great issue in the Republican Party? It was the nativist isolationism of the, if you're not, America First movement, led by Charles Lindbergh, and the man at the time who was known as Mr. Republican, Bob Taft. Okay? Similarly, right of center parties, in the pre-Civil War area, the Whigs were the right of center party. They fractured into the Free Soil Whigs, led by Daniel Webster, the first of people who lived in the northeastern United States. And the others became what were known as the Know Nothing Party, whose ideology and practices were characterized by fervored rallies and uh, demagogic uh, populism and uh, hatred of foreigners. Make any stuff up. Okay? <laughs> and the right of center party is the one that freed the slaves just a decade later. Similarly, the right of center party held at bay the populism of Andrew Jackson. There was somebody who's to the left who's the threat to the order of the Democratic Republic. So I tell you all this because the pattern, the Democratic Party, by the way, it's totally different. The Democratic Party goes to destruction and then gets enamored of somebody who they think is more liberal than they are. You can convince me that for their time, Franklin Roosevelt, John Kennedy, or Barack Obama are liberals when you're not paying attention. They were centrists. The Republican Party, on the other hand, when it goes to dysfunction, what ends up happening as it cohere's and moves hard to the right is it corrects with a figure who leads it on the very issue which was the underpinning of its being out of step with where the society was otherwise trying to move and leads the society in that direction. And my law school professor used to say, when the immovable object meets the irresistible force, the object moves. And you are the irresistible force. So something that I think would be helpful to hear from our panelists on is what are the worst things a well-meaning liberal can say in the attempt to reach out to 
a conservative. You don't understand. You don't understand the difference between you and my husband. How many times have I ever been on camera? Definitely look, not looking to walk down the altar for another 10 years or so, but I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> but uh, I just uh, just last May graduated from a very um, liberal, progressive, dominated college campus, Ithaca College, out in New York. And there is, uh, in every liberal arts program out there, this this fervor and this, this sense of justice uh, that goes into any issue. Every issue is an issue of great justice. So, for example, uh, you know, challenging you know, solutions on climate change, be it through talking to the government, perhaps even expressing some skepticism that it's not the issue, civil rights issue of our time, uh, led to you know, an onslaught of insults, be it you don't care about Mother Earth, ergo you're a sexist, or you know, you're anti-justice and you know, looking back at history, you're on the wrong side of history. So adding to you don't understand is that you don't care. Now, I can't think of, of one person in, in my organization or anyone I've worked with professionally who doesn't have you know, the best interests of moving you know, this generation and, and our fellow man forward. And the idea that a different solution to a problem is equivalent to, well, you hate the poor, or insert any ism or ist at the end, uh, it just shuts down discussion among young folks. And you know, that's why uh, you know, I posit we see a backlash of very polarized uh, you know, youth movements out there, be it you know, Antifa or the alt-right, or you know, neither of those are going to you know, create solutions or change really with kind of what's going on on college campuses. But the notion that because your viewpoint is different, you either don't understand or you just don't care, that's what shuts down. I mean, that's definitely been our experience on college campuses as well. Um, you know, I think that, again, we're dealing with a generation just as a whole, not even just talking about college Republicans on a given campus, but talking about you know, younger people on a college campus, those that aren't involved in the political movements on campus. Because those are the people you really want to capture. Those are the people that we're instructing our college Republicans to go after. Just go, you know, don't go after the the people that look like you, that think like you, that talk like you, go after the people who are different than you are to expand our party and to grow it. And, um, you know, I, I think when people come from such a polarizing place and when they have um, sort of a threshold obligation that you have to meet as the person to whom they are, uh, you know, giving their opinion or trying, or, or trying to sort of persuade you, it, it can be very unnerving. So, you know, I think that it's kind of like they have certain um, trigger points, maybe, is, is a good way to describe it. That if you don't agree with them in exactly the way that they want you to agree with them on their timetable, using their language, using, you know, exactly what they want, then you must be stupid. You must not understand the issue. You must be a terrible person. Um, so I think that it really comes from that that place of polarization that's so unfamiliar to this generation. It feels uncomfortable to this generation. You know, this generation isn't nearly as dogmatic as people either from the right or the left think they are or, or approach them as being. And so that's a very uncomfortable place just to start with, you know, no matter the kind of person that you're trying to target. And then the other thing I would say just generally is a mistake, and I, I tell this to our college Republicans all the time. I, you know, cause they, they say to me, Alex, how can I get the people on our campus to care about issue X more? How can I get them to um, be responding on this piece of legislation or going out to phone bank for this candidate? You know, what I tell them is don't forget that you're dealing with people for whom politics and the issues of the day may not be what's at the forefront of their mind. I mean, these are kids on a college campus. The club that they do on the side, 
It might be, you know, it might take a, a third or fourth back seat to the job that they have, the, you know, the part-time job, the classes that they're taking, the family obligations that they have. Uh, I, I know that that sounds really basic, but it's, it's so amazing to me how many political activists really forget that we're dealing with just human beings um, that aren't thinking about this nearly as intensely as we are. So I would say, you know, coming from a place of polarization um, and, and having and demanding that the person that you're trying to persuade meet you on your terms, on your timetable, is probably the worst mistake you can make, particularly with a, a Republican, a conservative that's sort of skeptical of change and wants to, you know, sort of consider all the options and maybe sort of debate the nuances. Um, but also just, you know, coming at it from a place of thinking that this is the most important issue of, of, of my, you know, my universe, so therefore it must be the most important issue your universe, it just, I mean, <laughs> you can be right and sort of have an audience of one, or you can meet people on their terms and really expand your base, in my experience. Basically, arrogance doesn't get you very far, is what you're saying. Um, Dave, uh, Jonathan Haidt, who's written a book we reference in some of our conservative messaging, uh, information, um, why politics and religion divide good people, talks about moral humility. And I think that's another good point. You need to think about what's in the other person's head. Um, and you can have to be right. Um, I just want to do one more quick question. We'll take some questions from the audience. But I'd like to talk about regulatory reform, because I find this is kind of a hot button for people. And as we've seen, there have been some terrific initiatives um, from the right on carbon pricing. I mean, Climate Leadership Council that came out in February with a, a terrific uh, carbon dividend plan. Um, recently, another one, the Alliance for Market Solutions came out with another revenue neutral carbon plan. But both of them talk about changing regulations, and this creates this horror. So, as a regulatory reformer at the end of the... Uh, it, it, it is our day. I just want to let you know. We've got five minutes. <laughs> We're very tight on time. Three of them for questions. So, uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of you believe we should? How many of you believe we should price carbon? How many of you believe we should eliminate uh, tax uh, subsidies uh, uh, like for fossil fuels? How many believe you should we should eliminate tax subsidies for wind and solar? Eliminate them entirely. How many of you believe we should do that? The hands get thinner and thinner. If you believe that pricing carbon works, then just scrap everything. Okay. You say absolutely. That is not what conservatives hear. Okay. It may be what you are saying, but of course, you know, <laughs> speaking, there's only worthwhile somebody else is listening. So what conservatives hear is that it's a double dip. We're going to do it again and again and again. So last week, I was able to convince a Republican governor who I happen to be personally very close to, uh, to be uh, one of the first two governors to uh, sign on. So they are still in the political establishment. Serious, serious. First two Republicans. It, 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 it wasn't that hard because I quoted that great orator and statesman, George W. Bush. You're, a, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. Okay. But the governors, and George said there are two governors, so I have told you which one, and I used to live in Vermont, so don't anyone get clever, okay? Uh, uh, the governor said, wait, I've got all this state level stuff. I've got, I've got the independent system on my ability. I've got Reggie, and now you're telling me I've got to do this as well. That is a good point, and it is a conservative, a fiscally conservative, a prudent person's perspective. Now, that was a toddler switch moment for either of us to be fair. So he signed on. It wasn't the right thing to do in terms of what we really should do. So in terms of regulatory reform, what I often say, we are sound by theory of solution, Dave said, more protection, less process, we actually meant it. Uh, but people were skeptical, it worked out pretty well. Um, and the phrase goes that's used in the regulatory reform world is streamlining. The key word streamlining is a streamlining, not a verb. So the streamline is where the uh, <laughs> the path of the water travels 
Dios escogió. Y sí, hay cuando la persona, I mean, even the church, do not agree with what I am trying to fix. Guess what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Little church of the Take a few questions from the audience. Um, there's a microphone there if you want to just talk about it. Just a comment on um, Sean. You mentioned free market, but I just want to underscore the, if it's a simple approach of the cost of a windmill versus the cost of fossil fuels, we do need to take into account the cost of carbon, the social cost of carbon in, in the free market system. So that not quite as simple up front. We actually are 4.15, so maybe because you should catch Because what I wanted to do is to hear each of you role play, one being conservative, one being someone who was the opposite, to hear the language that you were going to use. That's what I think would be helpful. Conservative messaging. Right. There's quite a bit of that role play in the conservative messaging, CCLU webinars, which would be really helpful. Also, I wanted to say that if you have questions, in this room are a number of members of the CCL Conservative Caucus with little red tags on it. So stick your hands up, caucus members. If you can find a caucus member and ask your questions, we can keep it going because somebody's going to come in and take this room pretty soon. We'd love to keep going. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, we need your help.